Good morning. Glad to see each and every one of you in God's house today. Pray that you've had a good week. and uh, We're praying for those. The numbers are going up. and We're praying for those that have. We uh, just knew of someone in our community that passed away this week. Uh, we have a funeral today. And so we just remember that family. Uh, we'll open up here uh, with just a short prayer, and then we'll have prayer and take requests at the end after we get to our message. When we get into the message, we have a lot of historical background to this message that we have today in Haggai. So we want to take the time to really get into this message uh, and that we've entitled Revivus again. So let's just open up with a prayer. Let's ask God's blessing upon this service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given to us. Thank you for allowing us to wake up, to see another day of life, and to be here uh, to worship you. Dear Lord, we pray that, that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that you would remove me and that it would be your Holy Spirit that is speaking to us uh, as, I'm, as, as the messenger is proclaiming the word that God has laid upon his heart. And so we just thank you for each one that is here. We pray for those that are traveling, those that may be sick, those that are uh, uh, shut in. We just touch, touch them. We pray for those that are they're going through a difficult time, that you would be very real to them during this time. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If you take your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Haggai. Uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Now, if you go to the middle of your Bible at Matthew and you go back about three books, that's where Haggai is. It's one of the minor prophets, and it's only two chapters. A uh, very short book, but it's a wonderful book, uh, and it goes along with uh, Daniel uh, them carrying away captivity. Nehemiah and Ezra goes along with some of those things, the historical uh, significance of that. And this morning we want to preach a message that we've entitled, Revive Us. Again, Revive Us Again, one of the hymns that we sing many times and a beautiful hymn. Uh, so we'll look at that in just a moment. But let's begin with verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Zaphiel, and Joshua, the son of Jodek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sethiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to his word this morning. You know, it's always an honor and a joy and a privilege to open the sacred word of God and, and to, to see what God wants to say to us on this particular day and to bring you a message of hope and encouragement. And this morning, we are continuing our series that we've entitled Hymns That Proclaim Him. And we're looking at some of the great hymns of our faith that we find and that we sing. And we're looking at their theology and showing how that it strengthens our faith and proclaims Jesus Christ. You know, the great hymns of faith have been used by God down through the centuries to encourage, to inspire, to comfort, and to convict. And all of us as Christians at some point in our life, in our Christian walk, have been touched by the words of a hymn. The hymns are not just great sounding songs. They are sound theological statements. And what we sing about in these hymns and the hymns that we have in our book can be found in the pages of the Word of God. You know, it's always interesting to read the stories behind the hymn, see how God was at work in the author's life and see what he was doing, how he inspired, how he encouraged them to write the song. You know, there are many inspiring stories connected with the writing of our hymns, but it would be very difficult to find a more unusual one than what happened to William Mackey, who wrote Revive Us Again. When at the age of 17, he left his humble Scottish home to attend college, his godly mother gave him a Bible in which she wrote his name and a verse of Scripture. While he was away from home, he began very well. But like most of us, when we go away to school, things kind of fall apart. As time went by, he drifted farther and farther away from the way he had been raised and the teachings uh, from the church and how he'd been raised as a Christian or how he'd been raised in a Christian home, and he began to drink heavily. He began to party. And at a low point in his, in his life, to satisfy his thirst for whiskey, he carelessly pawned the Bible that his mother had given him. Many years went by. Eventually, Mackey completed his medical training. He took up his work in the city hospital. Then one day, the Lord met him in a special way. I imagine it probably started out like any other day. He was doing his rounds. He was writing his reports. But in one room, he had an encounter that changed everything. It was a sad case. The patient was nearing the end. There was no hope for him. 
And he kept saying, bring me my book. I need my book. And the words seemed to echo in the flinty soul of Dr. McKay. A while later, he was told that the man had died. And the doctor went back to the room, curious to find out what book had been so precious that this man was wanting it. And it would hold a dying man's greatest desire. Soon his search uncovered a Bible. But not just any Bible. There inside the front cover in his mother's handwriting was his own name, William Patton Mackey. It had been years since he had seen it, but there could be no mistake. Someone had reclaimed the Bible from that pawn shop and it had become a priceless treasure to a dying man. Mackey went into his office and he closed the door. He opened the Bible and he was slowly turning the worn and weathered pages. Many contained specially marked verses that his mother hoped he would read. He was alone in that room for many hours. And when he emerged, the long night of sin had been blasted away by a life-changing experience from heaven. With a newly tender heart and a desire to reclaim wasted years, he resigned his position at the hospital. After training, he went on to serve the Lord as a pastor. It was W.T. Mackey who wrote the hymn, Revive Us Again. He was inspired to write this hymn because of a verse that his mother had underlined from the following scripture in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2 which says, O Lord, I have heard your speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. We know the words to the song, Revive Us Again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with Thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revival. The word revive, what Webster's Dictionary defines revival as a reviving or being revived, a bringing or coming back into use of something, a new presentation of an earlier play, a restoration to vigor or activity, a meeting led by an evangelist to stir up religious feeling. But what does God say revival is? True revival will come only when we bring our traditions, our preferences, our religions, our righteousness, and our rituals to Jesus Christ and lay them at the foot of the cross. We pray for our nation to turn to God. But the nation will never turn to God unless the church first turns to God. Do we really want revival? Do we even recognize that we need revival? Revival will come when all the sleeping folk will wake up. When all the lukewarm folk, folk will fire up. When all the dishonest folk will confess up when all the disgruntled folks will sweeten up, when all the discouraged folks will look up, when all the estranged folks will make up, when all the gossipers will shut up, when all the dry bones will wake up, when all the true stand soldiers of the cross will stand up, and when all the church members pray up, then we will have revival. The church is in need of an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival. Haggai challenged the people of God to rebuild the temple of God to experience revival. Revival comes when God's people hear the Word of God, when they heed the Word of God, when they hearken to the Word of God, and when they honor the Word of God. When the saints are revived, the sinners will be redeemed. And that is the petition that we have to God today. That He would revive us, that we would see redeeming uh, people being redeemed and saved. May the Lord revive His work and revive His people. This passage of Scripture reveals some results when revival comes. When revival occurs, we will see these things and we will know we are experiencing revival. First of all, when revival occurs, we will believe the Word of God. In verses 12 and 13, you know, there's, there's a, and right now we have people even in churches that don't truly believe that this is the inspired Word of God. They pull it, parts of it out. They only say and claim these verses, but others, they don't say it's God's Word. Every word from the beginning to the end is God's Word. It is inspired. It, the Bible says here in verses 12 and 13, 
Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shephiel, and Joshua, the son of Jacedit, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Now let's look at the history of this. The Babylonians, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, had destroyed the city of Jerusalem, including Solomon's temple in 586 B.C. And he took most of the Jews captive to Babylon. There the Israelites could not practice their formal way of worship as the Mosaic law had, had prescribed because they lacked an authorized altar and an authorized temple. In exile for their sin and rebellion, King Darius ruler of the Persian Empire, had allowed the Jews to return to build the temple. And he did it in three ways. But first of all, there were 50,000 Jews that returned from exile that we find here in Haggai. They built the foundation when they went back, but they, they were facing opposition and they stopped. And for 16 years they had not rebuilt the temple, but they had been living for themselves. Apathy had set in and they had not returned to the Lord's work. They had not returned to God so God sent the prophet Haggai to the people with a word from God. Haggai is the second shortest book in the Old Testament with four short messages delivered in four months. His purpose was simple and clear. To motivate the Jews to build the temple and to put their misplaced priorities in order to put God first. They were building their own houses, neglecting the, the house of God, living for selfish desires instead of God's will. Now, there are four perils that Haggai deals with in his book. First, there is misplaced priority. They didn't think it was time to build a temple. They waited. But people, it's not time right now. Let's just wait for a better time. Isn't that what Satan wants us to do? Wait? Delay? There was incorrect perspective. They were looking at Solomon's temple, comparing the old people were talking about Solomon's temple, and they said this present temple would be nothing compared to that, so why should we even do it? They were looking at unrealistic expectations. They thought God would bless them just because they started, but God is not going to bless until we finish the task that He has called us to do. There was unnecessary fear. They looked at the Gentiles all around them and the strength of the Gentile nation, and they concluded that they were just too small. They couldn't do it. You remember in Nehemiah, they thought they were too small, but God used every man to do the work. So Haggai was preaching by divine authority as stated 25 times in 38 verses. He was a successful preacher because the people listened and obeyed his exhortation. Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah who represented the secular leadership. Joshua was the high priest who represented the spiritual leadership. God spoke to both of these individuals, the government leaders and the religious leaders, as well as the people, and they responded to the Word of God delivered by Haggai. They believed the Word of God because His message came from Yahweh of armies. That's what the text says, or it's actually Almighty Yahweh. That title appears 14 times, and the word Yahweh occurs 34 times in 38 verses in Haggai. He wanted their attention to be on God, not on the things of the world. During that time, the emperor of Persia had sovereign sway over the people and the empire. And his word became law, even to the Jewish people, even to the Jewish community. But God is now speaking, and God's word is greater than man's law. Amen? Haggai told them to consider your ways. Now you look in the first part of that verse. He says, consider your ways and change your behavior. The king had given them money to rebuild the temple, and they had used it for selfish desires. They were not experiencing God's blessing. They sowed much seed but harvested modest crops. And verse 9 says their grain was so light and small it blew away like the chaff and just barely met their needs. They had little fiber from which to make clothes and the clothes were thin and did not keep them warm. Their purses seemed to have holes in them. They didn't have enough money. An affluent, and this is what I want to say to us today an affluent generation of Christians that is wasting God's generous gifts on trivia and toys will have much to answer to God when they stand before Him. When you neglect obeying God's Word, there will be the loss of blessings from the hand of God. Our obedience results in Him drawing close to us, but our disobedience leads Him to distance Himself, to withdraw His presence from us. So Haggai makes three appeals here in verses 7 and 8. 
He appeals to the mind. He says, how is it that you think it's not time to build the Lord's house and you're living in your fine homes? Then there's the appeal of the heart. He says, consider your ways. Then there's the appeal of the will. Go up and rebuild the temple. You see, God is speaking to religious leaders today. But are they listening? God is speaking to government leaders today. Are they listening? God is speaking to Christians in the church. Are we listening? We will never truly experience revival in our lives, in the church, in this country, in our state, in our nation, or in the world until we believe the Word of God and start obeying the Word of God. Verse 12 says, They obeyed the voice of God. The people didn't mock or murmur against God's Word. They didn't resist or refuse His Word. They didn't debate, denounce, or deny God's Word. They didn't defy or despise God's Word. They didn't complain or try to correct God's Word. They didn't fight or forget God's Word. They didn't grumble or grudge God's Word. They didn't hate or huff at God's Word. They didn't pout or puff at God's Word. They didn't rebel or reject God's Word. They didn't withdraw and withstand God's Word. The people obeyed the voice of the Lord. Now the word obeyed means to hear intelligently and implies a hearing and hearkening to what is heard. Warren Winsby in his commentary says, when God speaks to us by His Word, there's only one acceptable response, and that's obedience. We don't weigh the options, we don't examine the alternatives, and we don't negotiate the terms. We simply do what God tells us to do and leave the rest with Him. Genuine belief always results in genuine obedience. When a man of God preaches the Word of God by the power of the Spirit of God, we have a responsibility to listen and to obey. The people obeyed the voice of the Lord because they heard the voice of the Lord. Because verse 12 says, the Lord was their God. We will never obey the voice of the Lord if Jesus is not Lord and we are not under the authority of the preaching of His Word. There are far too many Christians who are not under the authority of God's Word. They're not hearing God's Word. They're not letting the Holy Spirit speak to them in, in the, the, the church city. They need to be under the authority of the preaching of God's Word. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? God sends the revival to His people based on the response to His Word. One day, Billy Graham, uh, after preaching with passion and power, was at the back, of a, a back door with the pastor shaking hands when a critic came by and said, your old-timey preaching has put Christianity back 100 years. The evangelist replied to the man, that's not back far enough. I was trying to move us back 2,000 years. He continued to say, we must go back to the cross of Christ. We must go back to the faith which was once delivered to the saints and the fire and the passion of the early church. That's where we need to go today. Back to Calvary. Back to the empty tomb. Back to the resurrected Jesus. Back to an infant church who loved God and was not ashamed of Jesus and had the power of revival in their midst. We need to get back to receiving and believing the Word of God no matter what people say or think about us. We need to be a people who believe the book. Notice the text says they believe the voice of the Lord their God and it says also the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. That's very important there. They believe the man of God who preached the Word of God. The people trusted that God sent Haggai to them and that Haggai was God's messenger. God will not send revival until the people of God believe the Word of God from the man of God that He has placed in their midst. I want to say this, and I don't say it unashamedly. I know I've been called of God. My credentials may not be what other people's are. My experience may not be the same, but I know I have experienced the call of God. I know that I've been called to this church. God has called me here after much prayer and, 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 and studying, and God has called me to this church. And even though some may find things they dislike about me as a pastor or a person and my personality, you must hear God's Word presented from God's messenger, no matter who it is. A pastor had just taken a new church, and he was highly complimented on his first sermon at that church. A number of people told him it was just what the church needed at that time in the congregation. The next Sunday, he preached a good message again, but it was the same 
uh, it was the same message as the week before. They were greatly puzzled that he preached the same sermon. On the third Sunday, when the same sermon was preached again, the congregation waited on the pastor after the service to explain himself. The pastor replied, Why, yes, it is the same sermon. You told me the first Sunday it was just what you needed. And I watched all week for some changes in your life. But there was none. So I preached it again. I waited all the next week with still no changes. And I don't see any yet in your lives. Don't you think that I'd better prepare to preach that same sermon again until you get ready to listen and make changes in your life? You see, Haggai didn't have that problem. The people believed the man of God and they responded to the Word of God for the Lord their God had sent him. They believed that God had sent Haggai their way. This is the first step to hearing from God. Do you believe that the pastor that you have called is called of God and is called to bring the message that God wants you to hear? The people believed that Haggai was a man of God proclaiming to them what God wanted them to hear and what God wanted to say to them. You see, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, the Bible says this about pastors. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. It goes on to say in verse 17, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. God has sent this church men of God in the past. Some have left here. Some have been called off. Some, some have left on their own. Some of the church may have run off. I don't know every situation, and, and many of you do. But revival will not take place in our hearts, in our church, or in our community until the church gets right with Jesus. The bottom line is, are we believing the Word of God? Will we believe the Word of God? A visiting lady uh, whispered to her friends, the pastor closed his Bible. Is the sermon done? Her friend said, no. The preacher is finished, but the sermon has to be lived out in our life. It must be obeyed. It's not done until you begin to obey and live it out. Verse 13 says, Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. God told the people to build the temple and God told the people that He would be with them. That's enough for you to carry on. They had no excuses to do what God called them to do. We have no excuse not to obey, to believe the Word of God and obey the voice of God no matter what He tells us to do. Here's a great truth you need to remember. We believe as much as the Bible as we live. We believe as much of the Bible as we live. In verse 13, God said He would be with them and God has said to us, He will be with us. Do you believe that God is with us? He is Emmanuel. He is with us. We do not need to ask God to revive us if we're not willing to believe the Word of God. When revival comes, we will believe the Word of God. But secondly, when revival comes, we will behold the worth of God. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. When true revival comes, we will believe the Word of God and we will also behold the worth of God. We will give Him the proper honor and respect that He deserves. The people feared in the presence of God. The word fear means to be afraid, to stand in awe or fear. Godly fear means that we do not run away from God, but we run toward God. To have a godly fear means that we draw near to Him. We honor His name. We honor His house. We honor His word and we have reverence for Him. Do people in the church really honor Him and reverence Him? Do people outside the church honor and reverence the things of God today. To fear God means to forsake evil. And based upon that, I don't think we are honoring God. Proverbs 9.10 declares, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. A commentator wrote this, These people had a new and an awe and reverence for God, and they pondered the significance of their past disobedience and their past self-centeredness, and their new sense of obedience and divine priority. We need a new sense of obedience on divine priorities. The proper fear of the Lord always leads to obedience. The people of Israel beheld His worth. They realized that God was worthy of their best and worthy of their obedience. They realized that God was holy and above reproach, that He is an awesome God. And only when a people will fear before the Lord will revival come. 
In Isaiah 6, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. He trembled at the presence of the Lord and he pronounced a woe on himself. God cleansed Isaiah of his sin and called for obedience. Isaiah, Isaiah said he would go, go for the Lord. Now why would he say that? Because Isaiah beheld the worth of God. He feared in the presence of God and he responded to the call of God. In Joshua chapter 5, Joshua met the Lord Jesus and responded the same way. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. You see, the remnant that returned from the Babylonian captivity finally feared the Lord. Their godly fear is shown in their prompt obedience. Do we fear the presence of the Lord today? In America, has the church lost the fear of God? Do we recognize that God is worth our pursuing and He is worth obeying with all of our heart? True revival only will come when we believe the Word of God and we behold the worth of God. Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. When revival comes, we will believe the Word of God and we will behold the worth of God. But thirdly, we will begin the work of God. In verses 14 and 15, it says, So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shethiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jethedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. The Bible teaches us that the Lord does the saving, the Lord does the sanctifying, and the Lord does the stirring. Only uh, when, when, when He stirred us and enables us will we do the work. Hudson Taylor once said, When God's work is done in God's way for God's glory, it will never lack God's supply. God is not obligated to pay for our selfish desires and schemes. He is obligated to support His ministry. Now in verse 14 it says the Lord stirred their spirit. The word stirred means to awaken, to stir up, to rouse oneself, to rouse up. God woke the people up. God shook the people up. God stirred the people up. God aroused the people. God needs to wake us up today. He needs to stir us. You know, God needs to wake us up because where He is, is there is life. There is not deadness. Verse 14 says that God stirred up all the remnant of the people. One author said this, There was not one idle person among them. Every person was engaged at something in connection with the building. Not one required to be coursed in any way, dragged forth against his own will. You see, that's what we need in our churches today. And when there's true revival, that's what will happen. People will be accepting positions instead of giving up positions. They will be working for the Lord instead of saying, I don't have time. But you know, some churches, here's the way they function. We, the unwilling, led by the unknowing, and doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have done so much for so long with so little that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. The people believed the Word of God. They beheld the worth of God, and they began the work of God. We cannot believe the Word of God or behold the worth of God and not do the work of God. It had been 16 years since the people returned from exile. They were busy but they were barren. They were doing their own thing and not doing God's thing. The people were concerned about their own will and not God's will. The people were building their own kingdom and didn't worry about God's kingdom. They were building their fine, fancy houses that they were working hard to pay for, but God's house was laying in ruin. God's house represented a place of God's presence, the place of worship, the place of sacrifice, the place of prayer, the place of fellowship, joy, and peace. If we want to experience those things, we must honor God's house. We must honor God. The people were more concerned about doing what they wanted to do than what God wanted them to do. Does that sound like America today? When Haggai preached, the people were convicted of their sins and they responded to the word in obedience. Haggai aroused their conscience and they repented of their sins. The people responded to the word and they obeyed God. Verse 14 says, They came and worked on the house of the Lord their host, the Lord of hosts, their God. When revival comes, there will always be a change in priorities, a change in passion, and a change in purpose. 
the people of God had a new priority and they all came to begin the work of the Lord. Some of us have been challenged by the Lord to work for Him, to begin the work of God, and I pray that we respond. The cathedral quartet had a song called Step Into the Water. and One of the verses said, It's time we the people stood up for what is right. It's time we squared our soldiers back and raised our swords to fight. For the Bible is our weapon and the Spirit is our shield. The church needs more of its members to be workers in the field. We need to be workers in the field. We need to hear from God. You know, when, when uh, one of the people in the church had said something to me as far as uh, hearing the Word of God and for the preacher, they said, we prayed for so long to have someone who would preach God's Word to us. And we're thankful that you do that every time that you preach. And so we're preaching God's Word to you, and we pray that you would hear it as God's Word. You know, someone wrote this poem about people in the church or a person in the church. I've been a dead weight many years around the church's neck. I've let the others carry me and always pay the check. I've had my name up on the roll for years and years gone by. I've criticized and grumbled too. Nothing could satisfy. I've been a dead weight long enough upon the church's back. Beginning now, I'm going to take a wholly different track. I'm going to pray and pay and work and carry my load instead and not have others carry me like people carry the dead. The people in Haggai's day were physically to build the temple. Now, we're not to physically build a temple today, but we're to spiritually build the temple that God has placed us to be. We are His temple. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? We are to constantly building our temple reviving our temple by Bible study, by prayer, by attending church, by obeying the Word of God and spending time with Jesus. We build God's temple by submitting to the Father. We build God's kingdom by sharing our faith. God has chosen to build His kingdom through His Word being spread by us as children. The church has a responsibility to share the Gospel. We can never be more like that New Testament church in Acts when, when, unless we are consistently and courageously sharing our faith. We must begin to tell others about Jesus. When we are witnessing, then we leave a mark that we have truly experienced revival. When we are witnessing, we don't have time to criticize and grumble uh, about the church. We have time to speak about Jesus. We cannot say that we are doing the work of God if we never share our faith. I like what Warren Wiersbe says, the church today can learn a lesson from the Jewish remnant remnant of Haggai's day. Too often we make excuses when we ought to be making confessions and obeying the Lord. If the Lord is to be pleased with us and glorified before an unbelieving world, we must hear the word, believe the word, and act upon it no matter what the circumstances may be. And I say amen to that. May God help us to begin the work of God. We need to be working uh, in the field. Uh, the people uh, were, were doing this to, in, in, in Haggai's day. He said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. They were compelled to go forth. God has told us He would never leave us nor forsake us. And that fact ought to free us to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. When we have a proper fear of the Lord, we will begin the work of God in spite of all the opposition that Satan sends our way. The question I ask, would you accept the call of God today to begin to witness for Jesus? Would you accept the call to do the work of God by serving in His church? You know, I heard a story about a church which had four members. They had got down to four members. There was everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. The church had a financial responsibility, and everybody was asked to help. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but you know who did it? Nobody. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Lost people lived in the community that needed to be visited and witnessed to. And somebody was asked to help. If somebody got angry about something and, and they got angry because anybody could have done it. And after all, it was really everybody's job. And in the end, the witnessing and the visiting was given to nobody. And nobody did a fine job. On and on this went for years. Whenever work was to be done, nobody could uh, always be counted on. Nobody visited the sick. Nobody gave liberally. Nobody shared their faith. In short, nobody was a very faithful member to the church. Finally, the day came when somebody left the church and he took anybody and everybody with him. 
Guess who was left? Nobody. That's what will happen to a church until we get revival in our hearts. God is willing to send revival to His church, but we must be first willing to receive Him. We must receive His Word. When revival comes, we will believe the Word of God, we will behold the worth of God, and we will begin the work of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of His Word. And at this time, we're closing out the service. And if you have a decision to make, then you uh, can meet with me afterwards or, or, or talk to me afterwards. But at this time, we're going to have a prayer time. And we want to ask if anybody...